yeah, I hear that a lot every day. Carlina, help me pass these out, please. <laughs> I have been, trust me. Jeremy, help me pass these out, man. <coughs> it's a front and back thing. We are talking about depression. And um, that's, a, that's a really a serious subject. And so we want to... We want to um, approach this... <coughs> excuse me. Is it two sheets? Yeah, it's uh, not front and back, it's two separate sheets. Well, that sorry thing, it's supposed to be front and back. That's probably my fault. I don't know how to operate anything anymore. I can hit the on button and the off button, and I know how to count. While they're passing those out, I want to ask you all a question. How many of you have ever heard of Alice Metzinger? Alice Metzinger. What about Catherine Power? The truth of the matter is, it's one and the same person. Alice and Catherine are the same person. She was a terrorist. She was with an organization back in the 70s called Strike Force. And she was involved there in the 70s with a number of, of things like the, the Weather Underground did of uh, terrorizing in the Northeast up there. And she was up in Boston and part of a group. They needed more money for more terrorist plots. And so they robbed a bank. She was driving the car. Alice was, or Catherine, I should say. And Catherine was driving the car, and as they were getting in the car, one of the men turned and shot and killed a policeman. And jumped in the car, and they drove off. They each went different directions. Three of them were caught. Uh, uh, Catherine Power was never caught. She went from community to community to community, changed her name several times, and finally settled on Alice Metzinger. The real Alice Metzinger died as a baby uh, years before. She lived 20 years that way. But she had this secret. She actually even had a child, got married, you know, starting a life. And she had this secret of her past of being involved in a robbery and a homicide. And that secret caught up with her. She couldn't take it anymore, the darkness of it. So one day she got up and told her husband what she was about to do. And she went all the way back to Boston from Portland, Oregon. And she walked into the police station, the main, main police station, and she said, my name is Catherine Power. And you've been looking for me for more than 20 years. And here I am. I can't bear this any longer. Well, because of how long had passed and the fact she only drove the getaway car, they sentenced her to six years in prison. Um, she served her six years. She got out. They interviewed her and said, how does it feel? She said, well, when I went to the police and I confessed what I did, it was like stepping out of a darkness, the shade of darkness, into the light of day. And for the first time, I knew I wasn't living a lie anymore. You see, for those 20 years... She was just enshrouded in the depression of having committed such a crime and hiding it from everyone around her. And depression overtook her. Now, I don't think any of us here is doing that. I don't think... Uh, I have a relative that did that, but um, um, I don't think any of us are guilty of that. So... Uh, we, though, just like Miss Alice slash Catherine, find ourselves faced with this thing called depression. I want to tell you something. 100% of us will be depressed 
at one time or another. If you say, no, not I, then you're not living in reality. Because depression impacts everyone. Here's the amazing thing. This is what I didn't know. Lenise, I'm sure you probably knew this from your studies and, and somebody else here I'm sure probably knew it as well. But depression actually impacts 15 million adults and another 2 million uh, teenagers in the United States of America right now. I didn't know that. I didn't know the number on that. But it's actually something that impacts. It's common. It's a commonplace thing. When I say depression, impacts 15 million, I mean uh, that's moderate to severe depression. Um, that's, that's diagnosed depression from medical doctors and psychologists. Um, you, you're going to find in scripture over and over and over people who suffered from depression. You'll find that all over the place, everywhere you look. Moses endured depression, and Job, of course, as we know, and David, and Elijah, uh, just to name a few. You have ladies like um, Rachel and Hannah in Scripture. These ladies dealt with depression and showed signs of depression. Uh, Naomi, Naomi in the book of Ruth said, don't call me Naomi anymore. My name is Mara. My name is bitter. I mean, look at everything God did to me. Hold that thought. Because a lot of times when we're depressed, we blame God for our circumstances. And I could go a whole and half as I taught the book of Ruth about how they uh, left the place of God's promise and they went to a place God said, do not be. Um, they departed from God's presence as it were. I don't mean that literally, I mean that metaphorically. And uh, so she brought that on herself. Uh, Naomi did. Anyway. I want to talk to you, and you have some handouts there, some notes on recognizing depression. And um, the thing I want you to understand is it will impact every part of who you are, body, soul, and spirit. That's what happens with depression. It's not something that just impacts your mind. It will impact you, body, soul, and spirit, everything about you. Can I differentiate something here, please? Would you allow me to do that? When I say mind, I'm not talking about the brain. Uh, the brain is there. The brain is the hardware. The mind is the software. The mind is what's there and in, in, in is part of your soul. The mind is actually part of your soul. The brain is part of your body. Um, but um, when I say mind, I am referring to the soul level. Uh, of who we are as individuals. Let me just give you some illustrations about the body, uh, if I can, for just a moment as I push through this. Uh, Psalm 32, verses 3 and 4. Uh, I, I need somebody to read that for me, please. I want to actually want a vocal break. Psalm 32, verses 3 and 4. You have it, Pam? Would you turn and face the music, please? When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Thank you. That'll do. There's so much more in there that's rich and precious. And, and Psalm 32 is one of those psalms you need to read over and over again. You ought to really camp out in there because it also has blessing of forgiveness. And so you see, sometimes depression causes illness when you're talking about your body. Sometimes it causes illness. And you will feel it. And you will see people who will end up with, and, and don't think because I'm about to say this, this means you're depressed. But you'll end up with migraines. Or you'll end up with, with um, stomach aches and ulcers and um, arthritis attacks. And where could I draw the line? of these things that will hit you with that. There's another thing though, insomnia. Insomnia. And David said more than one place, I, I can't sleep, I'm up all night. I'm crying all night, I, I lay awake at night time. And depression will do that to you. I went through a period of depression after a very severe case of hepatitis where I was extremely ill. Um, I was no help to Pam. 
who was uh, very pregnant and um, she was also ill from the pregnancy and we were having a rough, rough time. And there I was laid up in bed and so weak that one day I said to her, I want to go home and thankfully she couldn't hear me because I didn't have enough voice to say it loud enough. Um, because probably we would have come home uh, at that point. I was very sick. Well, I began to heal. God healed me. Long story short, God healed me. And um, the consequence, not of God's healing, but of the ailment itself, was I would go as much as one week at night and not sleep a single wink. Not at all. And I would be up 24 hours a day, seven straight days. I might take a 30-minute nap in the middle of the day, but I could not sleep. And I thought, what's causing this? Uh, I realized it was depression. I realized that the ailment that I had resulted in depression, which resulted in this insomnia that took over my body. But I've known other people who didn't have a physical uh, trigger like that, but who, because of the depression, they're, just, they're so overwhelmed that they're just walking around and they're moving. And I wonder sometimes, I have moments when I can't sleep now. Somebody said that would come my way one day, and lo and behold, it's here. And um, I have to be very careful with caffeine intake after about 2 o'clock in the middle of the day or anything like that. Or I'll be awake at 3 o'clock in the morning. Not wake up at 3, I'll still be awake at 3. And uh, sometimes I'll get on Twitter at that hour, and I find people up... Uh, Sean, um, I didn't say you, but I find people up and they're, they're putting, posting all these ridiculous things and I'm thinking, what are you doing out of bed anyway? You know, why are you up at this hour? You need to be asleep. And, uh, but, but that happens to people, insomnia. But then there's one more thing, indolence. You just don't want to do anything. You just absolutely don't want to do anything. I know I need to wash clothes. I really don't care. So I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to change channels on the television. I know that I really need to, I know I really need to uh, uh, um, get a meal together because the family's going to want to eat, but I don't feel like it. So they can eat peanut butter and jelly again for all I care. You see what I'm saying? That kind of indolence takes over. You drive by somebody's house and the grass has grown up two feet tall and, and um, you wonder what's going on in their heart. That's the body. Those are all physical things. Um, let me move quickly and talk about the soul. And um, as we talk about the soul, Psalm 42.3 is precious. Somebody read that for me, Psalm 42.3. David Halsey. Here's it. There you go. My tears have been my food day and night. Sadness, ladies and gentlemen, will take over a person on the soul level. You know, we've already talked about despair and, and all of these things, and this leads into depression. But you just have, you're very melancholy. You're just sad. You know, some people by personality already have a tendency towards that. But then when they are overtaken by depression, um, they just seem to have this black cloud that follows them around everywhere they go. They're just sad all the time. And you want to you wanna ask them what we say and what I've said more than once. Won't you stand up and just lead us in a word of criticism, you know, in this moment? Because they're so sad. Self-degrading thoughts self-degrading thoughts. You begin to tell yourself, you're no good, you're worthless, nobody loves you. Or as I shared with you this morning from somebody who uh, uh, wrote me, I'm lonely, I'm all alone, nobody, nobody wants to be around me. And uh, you know, you hear that kind of thing, and I hear it a lot as a pastor, I hear those sorts of things. 
Well, we don't have time to delve into that and to discover where that may come from, but those are some of the thoughts. There are long periods of, excuse, uh, excuse me, <coughs> at this moment, long periods of separation due to antagonism and irritability towards other people. In other words, you isolate yourself. You isolate yourself. You separate yourself from others. Proverbs 18.1 says, It's a fool that separates himself, argues against wisdom. I really don't want to be around people. Can I tell you something? The thing you need to do when you don't want to be around people is be around people. You need to do that. You need to do the very opposite of what your mind is telling you to do. And then sadly, the last thing I'll share with you there is suicidal thoughts. Suicidal thoughts. This is hopeless. Life is not worth living. I think the world would be better off without me. There are any number of statements that can be made that, that betray suicidal thoughts. What would you do if I were not here? A statement, a question like that. Would you be happier without me? Those sorts of things. So these all go on in the soul. But then there is the spirit as well. And when you talk about the spirit and you're speaking about the spirit, you're speaking about things like prayerlessness. And not only prayerlessness, you don't want to talk to God. You have no interest in the word of God. And then there is that resentment towards God. These things will take place just like Naomi. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Call me bitter because God has really dealt me a bad one. And you have resentment towards God when you're in times of depression. Job became very angry, didn't he? In what he said, why won't God speak to me? Why won't he answer me? in a time like this. So um, there, there we have uh, signs of depression and how to recognize it. I want to go through some examples. We may end up stopping on the examples and not get to, not get to the solution uh, for depression, but examples of depression. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is Job. And there's some questions he asks over in chapter 3. So look over there if you would for just a moment, please, in Job 3. And by the way, when you look at Job and you, and you examine Job in, in the light of depression, you see that Job suffered depression from spiritual oppression, from spiritual attack. That's why he suffered depression. Sometimes, Makita, listen to me, you're about to hit the mission field, you're going to be attacked spiritually, and it may come through depression. Or depression may be one of the byproducts of it. But it's going to come your way. You can count on that. And um, I don't want that to happen to you. But I know that when it does, you need to think back to this moment that spiritual attacks can do these kinds of things to you. So Satan attacked his family. Satan attacked his fortune. And Satan attacked his physical health. He did all of that to him, to Job. And so there's Job, and you have in the third chapter, you have this statement, this categorical statement that Job has made in verse 3. May the day perish on which I was born. Um, he states that in verse 11. Why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish when I came from the womb. And verse 20, why is light given to him who is in misery and life to the bitter of soul? He was actually asking some pretty good questions there. The good thing is he never cursed God. He didn't have a lot to say about the day he was born, but he never cursed God. 
he held to his integrity even in that moment, but he asked some questions. We will use that in a moment and bring that up. So that is one of the things that will happen to you. There is David who suffered depression from unconfessed sins. Somebody read Proverbs 28.13 please. Proverbs 28.13 Diane? 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 Whoever conceals or covers his transgressions will not prosper. And this is what David did. Well, you know what he did. He coveted another man's wife and he committed adultery with that woman. And then he commanded the murder of, of Uriah, the very man that, uh, whose wife, with whose wife he committed adultery. He did those things and yet he covered it up. But he didn't hide it from God, did he? He didn't hide a single thing from God, and God knew it. And so the words that we read in Psalm 32 were David's words when he was finally getting right with God, and he was finally saying, boy, I kept silent, I wouldn't confess it, but when I did, finally, I got relief from these things. As long as I kept silent, my body hurt me head to toe. I was in misery for what happened and what went through me during that time. And then there's one more I want to give you and spend a little bit more time on. His name is Elijah, and he's in 1 Kings 19. And you see, Elijah suffered depression from overwhelming circumstances. Overwhelming circumstances. Now I need to tell you something. Sometimes circumstances are thrust upon us. You're driving down the road and somebody runs a red light and T-bones you and now you find yourself in the hospital with uh, broken bones or whatever kinds of, of damages there and you're going to be out of work for several weeks and then your boss so generously calls you up and says I can't hold your job any longer I'm very sorry you no longer have a job and you find yourself waylaid on the side and you're thinking my goodness what has happened but sometimes we bring circumstances upon ourselves. We thrust ourselves into the midst of circumstances. And one of the ways we do that is with busyness. Because you see, we search for significance in what we do and not who we are in Christ Jesus. And you will find yourself, when you, when you over-program your life, you will reach a point of emotional and spiritual depression and it could go to the physical level but you will find that happening in your life and you need to have a very balanced and prioritized life I'm telling you you do well let's look at Elijah for just a minute and let's try to uh, glean some things from Elijah that will be, I believe, of some help for us. And the first thing um, if I want to tell you is that Elijah went from running with the Lord to running from the Lord's enemies. In 1 Kings 19, Jezebel comes along and says, um, you in trouble, buddy, and I've got you. And I'm going to do to you what you just did to my 850 prophets. And I'm not tolerating this. And you're going to die. And you count on that. Uh, it's coming your way. And it's coming your way quickly. And so Elijah jumps up from Mount Carmel. And he starts running with everything that he has. The second thing he did was he separated himself from those that could help him. The Bible says that he took he went down to Beersheba and he took his uh, servant with him and he left his servant there and he continued on his way. You see, that servant's been there helping him all along for quite some time. And uh, he, he finally separated himself from someone that could have ministered to him. 
Uh, number three, he began to plead for a way to escape. Actually, what he says in 1 Kings 19, verse 4, this is enough, Lord. I'm not better than anybody else in my family. Just go ahead and let me die. I can't take it anymore. I cannot take it anymore. Somebody read Psalm 55, 3 through 8, please. Who has that? Psalm 55, 3 through 8. Yes. At the voice of the enemy at the stairs of the wicked, for they bring down suffering upon me and revile me in their anger. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death assail me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. I said, Oh, that I have the wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. I would hurry to my place of shelter, far from the tempest and storm. Doesn't that sound like Elijah right there? I know Elijah didn't write that. But doesn't that sound like Elijah? If I only had the wings of a dove, I'd fly away. I'd just get out of here. That's what he's saying essentially. Uh, the, the David in this psalm, um, I'm, I need to get out. I need an escape here. And Elijah's saying the same thing. Excuse me, when he says, okay, Lord, I'm ready to die. Um, not only is he pleading for that and for a way to escape, he's filled with self-pity. He tells the Lord, I'm the only one. Nobody else like me in this world. I'm it. I'm the only one out there trying to serve you. The Lord corrected him on that, as you well know. Um, that's also the next thing. His view of life and his importance became irrational because he felt like he was the last one on the planet who was serving the Lord. You ever feel that way, by the way? Well, I, want, I got some news for you. You're full of hooey when you think that. Because that's just not true about any of us. Uh, God always has somebody serving him somewhere. Amen. And then they, and Elijah temporarily lost touch with God and began to do things his way instead of God's way. That's why God said to him in 1 Kings 19, what are you doing here, Elijah? You see, every other time God told him, this is where I want you to be. You go there, I've commanded someone to take care of you there. You go there and this is going to happen. You go to Mount Carmel now and this is going to happen. And so he sees them down there in uh, actually the area that today we would, we would call, describe as Petra over there um, somewhere near the Dead Sea, over in that area. That's where he was. That's where he went to. And um, the, uh, the Lord says, what are you doing here? I didn't send you here. Why are you here? This is not where you belong. And there's a lot more in that story that I'd love to share with you. But I do want to get into the last, and I can do this in five minutes, how to escape the claws of depression. I want to give you some tools that will help you. And I know this is elemental, ladies and gentlemen. I could have gone into great detail about serotonin and dopamine and, and all these other interesting things out there, but that's not my purpose in doing this tonight. This is not a medical conference. This is biblical and this is what God says in his word. The first thing you need to do is reveal your depression. In chapter 7 of the book of Job, the Lord, uh, the, the Job is speaking and he says, I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. You say, preacher, you always talk about you don't need to be complaining. There are things you actually need to tell God. And you have a soulmate in your life, a partner in your life. You need to be able to have somebody you can confide in and say, this is absolutely the worst period of time in my life. I really need your help right now. I feel like I'm at the bottom. Um, 
So I'm not talking about becoming a complainer. I'm speaking about uh, being there with someone who can listen to you and give you good counsel. I have two friends, um, one that I depend on far more than the other, that uh, I pick up the phone some, from time to time and I say, hey, uh, man, I'm going through some things. I just need to hear a, a different perspective. I need you to be my pastor right now in this moment. Um, and and uh, this, this is a blessing for me because believe it or not, uh, all of us, like I said, will face these moments of depression. If you think it's easy being pastor of a church even the size of ours, um, I have some uh, news flash for you. Sometimes it's an overwhelming thing. Sometimes it's very challenging. You get phone calls from people. Are you busy right now? Yeah, I am. Oh, okay. Well, let me tell you what's going on in my life. I got one one day. I need you to call me right now. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not well. Um, this has been recently. I'm running a fever uh, and, and I'm really sick. I, no, call me now. Okay. And I call. You don't know what kind of day I've had. I've been through this, 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 and this. And, 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 and you just won't believe this family member and that family member and the other. And blah, 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 blah. You know what I'm saying. And um, I said, I'm sorry to hear that. I said, well, how are you? And I said, well, I have a fever over 100 right now. I'm not doing too well. Oh, I'm sorry. You should have said something. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, here's your sign. <laughs> um, you know, anyway, I have, to, I have to call people sometimes and say, would you please give me some wisdom before I find myself crawling into a bucket somewhere and hoping that nobody can find me for about two weeks? You know, <laughs> because I feel that way sometimes. Y'all gonna think, we got a weird pastor. Well, you do. Um, Larry knew it when, when he Skyped with me <laughs> at that point. So here's the thing. Uh, you, need to, you need to have somebody you can counsel with. But then above all, you need to tell the Lord, Lord, I'm going through a really rough time. Lord, I need you to speak to me. And may I recommend the greatest, the greatest medicine I've ever used for depression is found beginning in Psalm 1 and ending in Psalm 150 and reading through the Psalms. God has spoken to me and lifted my spirits so many times through the book of Psalms. And uh, that is the most precious medicine I've ever enjoyed when it comes to depression. Then resist your depression. Don't just reveal it, but resist it. Don't give in to it. Depression's your enemy. It's, it's an enemy. It's there. It's your sworn enemy to bring you down and, and to destroy you. And if you're not careful, depression will become the new normal for you. I know people that that have been chronically depressed and they think that's how life's supposed to be now. And uh, kind of like some of the folks, if you sit and you're real quiet in the clinics, Lenise, verify this for me. You can be real quiet. You'll hear people talking and bragging about how many ailments they have. You know? And I sit there and I listen to that and say, you know, folks, um, I think our purpose in being here is not to discover a new ailment, but to get well and get over these things and so we can go on with life. But some people actually think it's just normal to be sick all the time. And they mean that with depression as well. They think that's normal. It's not normal. And God has a solution for that. And God can heal you in times like that. So... Um, when you, when you let that become your comfort zone, you lose your vision for how life can really be. And you don't want to do that. And then thirdly, replace your depression. Don't just resist it. Don't stop there, but you need to replace it.
Replace the temptation to isolation with participation. You're going to be tempted to close yourself off. Don't do that. Be involved, especially in ministering to other people. That is a valuable thing. Replace introspection with supplication. Instead of sitting there having a pity party, looking at yourself, what you want to be doing is saying, Lord, can you show me the solution out of this and turn it into a time of prayer and replace agitation where you're being irritable to everybody around you with celebration. Praise to the King. And your spirit will be agitated within you when you're depressed, I promise you. You get mad. You're angry. Why am I angry today? Well, I'm not one of those introspective kinds of people that walks around asking that question. But I have learned that if you will take a moment and have a moment of celebration, of praise to the Lord God, a lot of times that dark cloud over you lifts. And that depression will pass in your life. Now, you don't have to play the game of life with a partially deflated ball. You don't have to. You can live life to its fullest and enjoy it. Don't think you'll never be depressed because you will. But when you are, Remember these simple things I've given you tonight. Larry, lead us in a closing prayer, please, sir. Father, we thank you for your word. And Father, considering the subject, I, I, I would pray that truly you would tell us always, always be aware that, that the Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit, you and Jesus Christ are our counselors, you are there for us. And Father, if we never forget that, then we'll be so much better off. Lord God, go with us now. Watch over us. Bring us back safely here again in the next service. And Father, again, we thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.